Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Well, we're close to finishing uh, 2 Samuel. We have two chapters left. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 23. If you turn your page, you notice there's only two chapters left, um, but don't get too excited about that prospect because uh, there's a lot in them. So I have learned not to make any promises because I've made them so many times and broken them as to how far we're going to cover on a certain uh, night through a book. And um, the way I look at it is we have two um, Wednesdays left in December to finish 2 Samuel. Next week is taken, of course, um, I'm not going to teach. Fernando is going to come and sing. By the way, there's something about listening to his worship, his hymns, his Christmas songs, some that he has written himself, some that he has taken from the past and reconstituted. That is just absolutely soothing to the soul. So if you want to just come and be refreshed in the presence of God, next week is, uh, is that night. And then uh, the week afterwards, we have one more Wednesday teaching before uh, we're deep into the Christmas uh, season. The following week is Christmas week. We will not be meeting uh, that Wednesday night. So um, we have uh, two more weeks, including tonight, tonight and next time, to cover the book. So I'm not in any hurry. All that to say, I'm not in any hurry. So we have uh, at least chapter 23 tonight, and uh, maybe we'll dip into 24, but let's see how it goes. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to gather together in the middle of the week um, and to focus in on going through the scriptures verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, Old and New Testament. Thank you for the hunger that is here in this group who have made it their priority week after week to come. And Father, your word says that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. So we pray that you would surprise us, Lord, and bring application and give wisdom. We've been praying about direction for certain things, all of us, no doubt. And so, Father, we pray that just as we worship by listening to the word taught, that simply you would direct us, nudge us by your spirit in those areas as we hear the truths expounded to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We are coming now to the end of David's life in chapter 23, and what a life it has been. Here's a young shepherd boy who lived an insignificant life, who was so insignificant in his father Jesse's eyes that he wasn't even included in the lineup when Jesse came to his house in Bethlehem to select the next king. So the prophet had to say, is this all your kids? Do you have any other children? And Finally, Jesse said, well, we got one kid out there watching sheep. You know, he's just almost like a hired hand. He is technically my son, but, you know, he's just one of those kids. Like, you know, he's in the FFA, and he's always hanging around animals and sheep. And that we just keep him out there. And, and so the prophet finally said, bring him in. And the Lord said to Samuel, this is the next king of Israel. He went from a shepherd to a warrior. We see him on the battlefield against Goliath. We see him heading up the armies for King Saul. We see him valiantly vanquishing the Philistines. Then we see him as the ruler over the southern kingdom of Judah as he is crowned king down in Hebron. And eventually, he is the king over the entire nation of Israel. A man after God's own heart, called thus by the Lord himself, and noted by the prophet Samuel, 
but a very imperfect man, as we have seen time and time again, and we'll see again at the last chapter of this book, the 24th chapter. But again, just think of David's life. Shepherd, warrior, oh, I didn't add musician, was part of it. Interesting mix to be a fighting man and also have that sensitive musical side, creative side as well, and then become the, the king over the nation. There's an interesting scripture in the Old Testament in the Minor Prophets where God tells his people not to despise the days of small beginnings. You know, you're in a job you don't like, you're in a position you hate, you're part of a family, you didn't sign up for it, you were born into it. You might be listening to this from some obscure village, who knows where. God's got you covered, he's got your number, he knows where you live. He is quite able to take a David from the sheepfolds and make him king and the heir of the Messiah so he's able to do wonders with your life. Don't despise the days of small beginnings or small things. Well, when we get to chapter 23, 2 Samuel 23, we have what is called here the last words of King David. Now these are, verse 1, the last words words of David. More appropriately, it should read, this is the last psalm of David. We don't know if this is the very last thing that he said. It is certainly a hymn of praise. It is a psalm of sorts. So I, I reckon this is the last psalm of David. Uh, we know that David died surrounded with friends and family. Among his last words were words to his son Solomon about the future. And then it says he, he died. He was gathered up to his people. That's in 1 Chronicles 21 and 22, uh, right around that section. So he was surrounded with friends. He was surrounded with family. But this is the last psalm of David, among David's final words on earth. Now, you know, a person's first words aren't really all that notable. I know every parent thinks they are. You know, my, my little daughter, you know, she said her first words. Really? Well, what, what were they? You know, yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Hope you recorded that because that's profound. <laughs> and they're really not profound. They're pretty much, we all say the same thing. Might be mama, dada, La. or whatever it might be some utterance of a sound, some monosyllabic or maybe even double syllable, but probably not. However, a person's last words, now those are significant. And they are different. Our first words are probably mostly the same. Our last words are very different because a person's dying words are often predicated on how they lived. We die based on how we live, what our view of life was, what our, our perspective of life was. When David Hume, the unbeliever, the British skeptic, was on his deathbed, his last words were, I am in the flames. Imagine dying and thinking only of a future punishment in hell. I am in the flames. Voltaire, the French atheist, mocker of Christianity, said, among his last words, I am abandoned by God and man. O oh Christ, he shouted. O oh Jesus Christ. And he moaned and he cried all night long until he took his last breath. The nurse who attended Voltaire said, for all the money in Europe, she would never attend the death of another unbeliever. But you can have a different way of dying. I'll never forget visiting a gal who was a part of our fellowship, happy gal, Barbara. Always see her at church, always worshiping God, always something good that she had to thank God for. At a relatively early age, she developed 
a cancer that took her life, and I visited her in the hospital, and as I walked into the hospital room, I kind of expected dark, dim, dire circumstances, and she was sort of drugged up and half asleep, and then suddenly she opened her eyes, sat up, looked around, saw a few of us standing there, and she goes, I'm ready. <laughs> and then she closed her eyes, put her head back on the pillow, and went to heaven. I looked at that and said, I'd really like to die that way. That's a good death. That's a good death. I'm ready. Not I am in the flames, not I'm abandoned by God and man, but a hymn of praise. I'm ready. Well, these are among David's final words. These are the last words of David. And notice this description. Thus says David, the son of Jesse... Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed, literally the Mashiach, that's the Hebrew word, Messiah, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. You have in a single sentence a biographical sketch of King David's life, of David's entire life. Son of Jesse, it's my genealogical roots. A man raised up on high, from shepherd boy to warrior to psalmist to king. The anointed of God, the greater son of David, will indeed be the anointed, the Messiah. I see him speaking here prophetically. And the sweet psalmist of Israel. So he went from being a peasant to royalty. You know, so have you. You, the Bible says, Peter says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. The people of God, the peculiar people of God, a, a, a people of his own. You have gone from spiritual peasantry, poor in spirit, to being a son or daughter of the living God. You're royalty, man. Like David, he has raised you up. And I've always loved that description in verse 1, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now, this is David speaking, or it could have been somebody else that gave him that moniker, but I like it, the sweet psalmist of Israel. David wrote many of the psalms, not all of them, but at least 73 of the 150 psalms are designated as being written by David. He may have written more. Written more. Some of them are anonymous. He may have written many more. But he wrote a chunk of them, at least 73. So just about half, if not more, were written by David. And that's significant because the Jewish people have always incorporated the Psalms of David into their worship. Not only did the Israelites do that, but the early church used the book of Psalms, the Psalms of David, as their worship. And that trend continues to the present day. Uh, worship leaders are often taking the Psalms and rewriting them, reworking them for a modern generation. I've always loved it when people do that, when they take uh, a Psalm of Scripture. And, and the best songs are scriptural songs. If you're thinking, well, I want to be a songwriter, just get inspiration from David. He'll show you how it's done. In fact, just take his words, because his words are the words of God. They're inspired by God. And rewrite them, reconstitute them for a modern audience. The sweet psalmist of Israel. Now, here's some of his last words. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. He is acknowledging that his words are inspired now. And his word was on my tongue. Now, when David wrote the Psalms, we don't know that if at that moment he understood that he is writing by the Spirit of God, but at some point in his life, it dawned on him, I think by revelation, hey, I am voicing the message of God. I am speaking the words God wants me to speak. This is, these are the words of God. And I think it probably dawned on him later rather than earlier. Maybe in his last latter days, he looked back and saw, wow, 
I may be reading his own Psalms. Hey, that's pretty good. I couldn't have come up with that on my own. That had to be the Lord. And you know, uh, going back to Peter again, I mentioned him already, but Peter said, no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men um, spoke, uh, prophets spoke, men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, carried along by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the word that Peter uses is of a ship hoisting its sail so that the wind carries it along to the destination determined not by the boat, but by the wind. So if God is inspiring a person to write, that means that person might write with his or her own personality, but the destination, the final word that is spoken, is exactly where the wind, the Spirit of God, wanted it to go. So the destination is exactly what God wanted to say, even though the writer has his own bent, his own outlook, his own personality, his own writing style. It can end up being the very words of God. That's the idea of prophecy, according to Peter. So the Spirit of God spoke by me. So David was not in a formal sense a prophet, but he did speak of the future. He did predict the future. But more than that, he was a spokesman for God. And in that technical sense, he was a prophet. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, there were designated prophets. They were people who were known as prophets of God. It was a formal calling in ancient Israel. When you get to the New Testament, there's a gift of prophecy, but the formal office of a prophet is different. It's not the same as in Israel, where you have a spokesperson to the nation or for the nation. There's not a national prophet. You really have a spiritual spokesperson. It's not always predicting the future, though sometimes it is. It's often just forthtelling rather than foretelling the Word of God, just speaking forth words of comfort, words of encouragement, words of exhortation, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's the gift of prophecy. However, and I'm balancing that out, there were certain ones in the early church who were known as prophets. Agabus was one of them in Acts chapter 11. He was one who predicted a famine that would come, and it happened. And so he was respected as such. David uh, is speaking here of the ideal king, as you will see. And I think he is speaking messianically like a prophet, though it doesn't say it's a prophecy per se. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just. Every leader should read this. Every king should read this. Every queen should read this. Every president should read this. Every Supreme Court justice should read this. Every governor should read this. Every mayor should read this. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like so often our mornings are, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear, shining after rain. David is describing the rule of the ideal king, the ideal anointed one, the coming Messiah. When he says that he who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. As I was reading that this week and the previous weeks, a thought occurred to me. So many decisions made by politicians are not made in the fear of God. Most of them. It's rare to find somebody who is a ruler over human beings in a, in a physical, political sense who thinks in terms of the fear of the Lord. What, what motivates most leaders is not the fear of God, but the fear of men, the fear of people, the fear of voters. 
What are people going to say? They may not vote for me. I better say this a certain way, even lie to them to garner their votes. So that rather than ruling in the fear of God, they rule in the, the fear of men. But what does it mean to rule in the fear of God? For that matter, what does it mean to live in the fear of God? What does the fear of the Lord mean? It's a phrase that is used, appears 110 times in Scripture. So it must be important. It doesn't mean that you cringe when you hear the word God or the Lord or Jesus. You go, <gasps> shudder. The idea of the fear of God, this is the way I describe it. This is what I believe is a biblical definition. The fear of the Lord is a reverential awe that produces humble submission to a loving God. And all three components need to be part of it. Reverential awe. I'm in awe of the Lord and, and, and I, I revere him. A reverential awe that produces humble submission, not my will, but thine be done, to a loving God. I realize that God is a God of love. I realize that God is good. I realize that that motivates all of God's actions toward humanity and especially his children. And knowing that he is loving, I want to submit to him. And the submission is, in essence, reverential awe. Reverential awe that produces humble submission to a loving God. If there's any being afraid at all, if there's any cringing fear, it's the fear that I would not please him because I love him and I know that he loves me. And when you love somebody and you're in relationship with them, it's a healthy fear to have. Oh, I don't want to say or do anything that would, that would hurt that person or displease that person. That's being in love. So it's reverential awe that produces humble submission to a loving God. And, you know, if we were, I, I could pick on leaders because leaders are mentioned here, but let's just, let's just go broad here. Let's, let's pick on all of us. If all of us would filter everything we do, all of our decisions, with that filter, the fear of the Lord, reverential awe that produces humble submission to a loving God, if that was our filter, Imagine how different our lives might become. And imagine how different a nation or a city or a state would become if leaders would rule in the fear of God. I hope you pray for your leaders. I hope you pray for your president, your vice president, your governor, your mayor. You go, well, I, I don't like them. All the more reason to pray. I didn't vote for them. All the more reason to pray. They need God's help. I have, on a few occasions, been to Washington, D.C., and it's an interesting place. I mean, you just feel the power walking around, and, 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 and you see people, you know, flexing their powerful muscles. And um, I've had the opportunity on a few different occasions for a few different presidencies to be in the White House and to be asked to pray for the president. Now, I haven't been asked to pray for this president, but I would if I ever was asked. I pray for any president. Pray for anybody who asks for prayer. But I had the opportunity to be in the Oval Office and pray for uh, a president of the United States. And, you know, it's an interesting thought because you think, wow, this is the most powerful man in the free world. But then you get seized immediately with another thought. But he's just a man. That's it. A man who has asked for prayer. A man who, for whatever reason or whatever circumstance, has enabled this to happen, but he's asking for us to talk to God on his behalf. Absolutely. In 1 Timothy, it says, I would, first of all, that supplications, giving of thanks, prayers, intercession be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life. Isn't that what you want? You want a good life? You want a quiet and peaceable life? Pray for your leaders. 
Pray for them. Pray that God gives them wisdom. Pray that they'll rule and reign in the fear of God. That's just a great uh, verse to know and to pray through when, when you are. We spoke about prayer this last weekend. Add that uh, to praying for your leadership. So he speaks about the ideal king, but notice what he says in verse 5. Again, David's last words. Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? David realized that he had failed. He's close to the end. He's giving his last psalm and he realizes you know, there's the ideal king, and I've been chosen by God, and he raised me up, and I'm the anointed, and I'm the sweet psalmist, but I haven't always lived up to the covenant calling of God on my life. Although my house is not so with God, David understood that he was king not because he deserved it, but simply because God desired it. That's what God wanted. I don't know why he wanted it, but he wanted it. And I'm going to take that. I'll, I'll go with it. I'll, I'll ride that wave. I'll, I'll take that as God's calling on my life. You remember back in um, 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God makes the covenant that he is speaking about. It began by David getting all excited about building a house for the Lord, a temple for God. So he brings Nathan in, David brings Nathan in and goes, Nathan, I've been thinking. You know, I live in this beautiful palace that I built for myself. God's living in a tent. He's still camping out. You know, he's in that little cloth RV out there, that tabernacle. It's just not right for me to live in such lavish surroundings, but God's still hanging out in a tent. I need to build him a temple. I need to build him a house. And Nathan, you know, is just pandering to the politician, oh, whatever is in your heart, man, awesome, that's good. Yes, you're a you're, good word. Do all that is in your heart. The Lord had to tell Nathan the prophet, you spoke out of turn, Nathan. He can't build me a house. His hands are full of blood. You need to go back and correct your little promise to David that he can do all that is in his heart. He can't build me a temple. His son will be able to, but David will not be able to. But you tell David this, I'm gonna build him a house. I'm gonna give him a legacy. I'm gonna build him a household, a progeny. A group of descendants will come from him. I'm gonna build him a household, and if he obeys me and his sons obey me, they're gonna last in that position. But ultimately, I'm gonna send the Messiah through him. And David understood that there was a covenant that included the Messiah, because in the next chapter he says, oh, who am I, O oh Lord, that you would call me and, and, and lift me up from being a shepherd boy and make me the king of your people? And if, if that wouldn't have been enough, and that was enough, you have spoken of things to come. You promised that the Messiah would come through me. So he understood that he was given this position, not because he deserved it, but because God desired it. And so he says, although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me, and notice this, an everlasting covenant. You know what an everlasting covenant is, right? It's one that will never end. It's one that will go on and on and on. And it's an unconditional covenant. Okay, so a covenant is a pact. It's an agreement. Uh, you have made covenants with people. If you bought a car, you've made a covenant that you make payments on that vehicle until it's paid off. Uh, and you make, uh, if you have a house payment or an apartment rental, same thing. You are entering into an agreement, a pact, a covenant. In the Old Testament, there were covenants that nations made with nations, that people made with people, and agreements that God made with people and with nations and with individuals. And those covenants, and by the way, it's an interesting study in and of itself. We don't have the time to really dig much into it, but I commend you a study on the covenants in Scripture. Because they fall into one of two categories. There are conditional covenants, 
And there are unconditional covenants. Conditional covenants mean that both parties are responsible to perform or bring something to the table. An unconditional covenant is not bilateral, it's unilateral. It's one party declaring and making it so. There are no conditions. It's just going to happen. It's a declaration. The first covenant in Scripture is the covenant in the Garden of Eden. God creates man, puts him in a garden, makes a pact with him. You can freely eat of all the trees in the garden. Just don't touch that one. It's the only condition. If you do in that day, you'll surely die. Very easy covenant, right? Pretty easy to figure that out. Not, not a lot of, it's not like a lawyer's brief of 10,000 pages. It's just don't do that. That is a conditional covenant. The covenant was broken. They leave the Garden of Eden. Much later, we read God makes a covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bless your offspring. I'm going to give them land. And it's the Lord in Genesis 12 saying, I will, I will, I will, I will. Over and over again, five times, God says, this is what I'm going to do. Now, that's an unconditional covenant. I'm giving you the land to you and the Jewish people forever, unconditionally. Later on, God makes another covenant with Moses for the people of Israel. Was it conditional or unconditional? Conditional. If you know the Mosaic law, you read Deuteronomy 28 and 29. If you obey me, I'll give you this and do that. And I'll bless you here and bless you there and bless you with your families and flocks and herds. Chapter 29, if you don't do it, you'll be cursed. I'll kick you out of the land. You're going to be hurting for certain, etc., etc. Conditional covenant. So now we have a problem. I said I wouldn't get much into it, and here I am getting much into it. God makes an unconditional covenant with Abraham and his descendants for the land. It's a real estate covenant. And then he comes along to Moses and he says, now you tell the children of Israel, them staying in this land is conditional upon their obedience. So which is it? Unconditional or conditional? Both. The land of Israel as a possession is unconditional. The land of Israel as to their position or tenure in the land is conditional. So if you don't obey me, I'll kick you out of it. But when I kick you out of it, I will eventually bring you back to it. Always, that, that's how it works. So he fulfills the Mosaic Covenant by the Babylonian captivity, 70 years of captivity, they're booted out. But God promised to bring them back. And when he brought them back, they were humble. And they never engaged in that kind of idolatry like they had during those Old Testament years. So God fulfilled both covenants, the conditional covenant and the unconditional covenant. But the covenant that he made with David was unconditional. Oh, there are conditions in it for Solomon and for the other physical progeny of David. But ultimately, he promised the Messiah and an everlasting kingdom in the piece of real estate that he promised to Abraham and his descendants. That's why I say it's a fascinating study to see how the covenants work independently as well as synchronistically. So David is musing on this. My house is not so with God. Yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure. By the time Jeremiah rolls around, the book of Jeremiah, and things have gotten so bad in Israel, the idolatry is off the charts. And people are wondering, well, maybe this covenant that God said that he was going to make with Israel isn't so binding and so lasting. Maybe it has a termination point. And maybe uh, he's just going to push Israel aside and do something different with the church. That's how it is wrongly interpreted by a group of theologians um, for the past couple hundred years. However, Jeremiah, the Lord declares, 
Um, if the stars go out at night and the moon goes out at night and the sun drops and doesn't work anymore, then I'll break my covenant with them. In other words, metaphorically saying, I'll never do it. I'll never break it. It's everlasting. It's going to last. As long as you look up and see stars and moon and sun, know that I'm faithful to my promises for David, for Abraham, for the Jewish nation. And I love this, for this is all my salvation and my desire. Will he not make it increase? But the sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands, but every man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned. In other words, you, you pick up the bunch of thorns with the end of the spear to place it in the fire and burned with fire in their place. Now look at verse 8. It changes now. After those last words, that last psalm of David, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. We now have, in the rest of this chapter, a gallery of names, 37 names, most of them really hard to pronounce. I don't know if you've read in advance this chapter, it's like, oh my goodness. You know, you get to the end of it. Just look at the very end of the chapter. See all those names? Yeah, those are the thorn bushes we're about to uh, get into. But um, 37 heroes, mostly military heroes, who were David's mighty men. Uh, these were uh, <laughs> a group of fighting men. And as we read some of this, it gets pretty gnarly. These were gnarly fighters. You know, these were, uh, these were special forces uh, guys. Now, let me take you back. In, you don't have to turn to it, but back in 1 Samuel chapter 22, uh, David is hiding from King Saul, right? For a period of about 10 years total, we know he was hiding. In one of the spots he was hiding, it was a cave called the Cave of Adullam. Do you remember that? The Cave of Adullam. When he was in the Cave of Adullam, it says in uh, 1 Samuel 22, and everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented came to David. Now that's, a, that's an interesting group to have get around you. Uh, it sounds like it's not going to be very fun. It sounds like there's not going to be a lot of positivity and joy in that group. Everybody's in distress. Everybody's in debt. Everybody's discontented. And they all get together. And David thinks, okay, I'll be their ruler. I can take these men who are in debt and discontented, these outcasts of society, and I'll make them an army. And he invests in them. He invests training in them. He invests trust in them, love, fellowship, and they become an army of 400 men, eventually 600 men. And they follow David from place to place and become, when he is king, the chief fighting men of his army. Now, just keep that in mind, because um, in the New Testament, remember what it says in 1 Corinthians about us? You see your calling, brethren. How not many mighty after the flesh, not many noble after the flesh are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the weak things to put to shame those things that are mighty, etc., that no flesh would glory in his presence. Look around at who God uses. People in distress, people in debt, people discontented. God says, I'll take them. I'll make them my army. I'll make them my church. I'll forgive their sins. I'll put purpose and meaning in their lives. They'll become my mighty men and women, my army. So these are the names. These are some of the names of these 400 men, the most notable ones. Uh, the mighty men whom David had, Josheb, Bashabeth, the Takmanite, chief among the captains, 
He was called Adino, which sort of sounds Italian. Adino the Esnite, uh, because he killed 800 men at one time. Now, as we get into some of these names and notice some of the exploits, there's a, a larger principle I, I want you just to keep in mind. What sections like this in the Bible show me when you have lists of names and people that are associated with certain people like David, David's the ruler, everybody knows about David. I guarantee you, every unbeliever in the world almost has heard of King David. He's famous. How many people do you suppose have heard of Josheb Bashabeth the Tachmanite? <laughs> Only you <laughs> and anybody else who dares to go through the scripture like this. Very few people. But what it shows you is that no one is an island. That if somebody is great and successful, it's because they've had family and friends and men and women who have gathered around them, staff members, board members, who have seen the common vision, marched alongside that person or that company or that group. And the reason for the success is the totality of the group that God uses not a single individual. Nobody can take credit. And I am sure that David, when he took them, I mean, he takes people in distress and in debt and discontented, he could hang with that because he thinks that's going to change. They're not going to be in distress forever. They're not going to be in debt forever because I'm going to forgive their debt. They're not going to be discontented. I'm going to make them content. So David could hang with all of that bad stuff. What he, I think, was looking for is just Faithfulness. You know, the greatest ability is dependability. Just let me find somebody who's dependable. Now, I know some of the names in here. I'm familiar with them. And, and some of them were indeed mighty men. In fact, we could even say if God was looking for a king, he could have easily pushed David aside and picked one of these because they did incredible exploits and had leadership skills. But rather than that, they decided we're going to be loyal and we're going to follow the vision God has given David. God's choice, not ours, <laughs> but we're going to follow it. That's admirable. Ever heard the name Leonard Bernstein, the great conductor, musician? When he was alive, somebody asked him, Mr. Bernstein, of all of the pieces, of all of the parts in the orchestra, of all the people that play, what is the hardest piece, person, status uh, that you have to fill? What's the hardest thing to play in an orchestra? And he said, without hesitation, second fiddle. He goes, I can find plenty of people who will sign up for first violin, first chair in that, playing that instrument. But to be second, he goes, that's so difficult. And for a lot of people, even in ministry many times, to just say, look, I'm, I'm just going to be content to serve the common vision. I don't have to do my own thing. So David found these people rough as they were, but they were faithful to David. They stuck with David from the cave of Adullam all the way through those periods of David's life and ministry. And one of them is this famous person here, Joshua Bashabath, the Tachmanite. Chief among the captains, he's called Adino because he made pizza. No, the as, as night, uh, because he killed 800 men at once. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. <laughs> of course, that is the famous bird that you've heard about. The, have you heard of the Dodo bird? Okay, yeah, of course you know I'm kidding, right? That's, you're not supposed to do that. You're a Bible teacher. Sorry. <laughs> you got to love me for who I am. Eleazar, the son of Dodo. Now, in Hebrew, it's interesting. Dodo, Dodo, is um, the diminutive form, the familial form of the name David. It's the endearing nickname for the name David, Dodo. In Israel, it's Dudu. <laughs> I had a tour guide years ago named David Asael brilliant tour guide. 
But he'd always introduce himself, and he, from the first time I met him, he goes, I'm doo-doo. Whoa. <laughs> and of course, he understood that in this country, that's not a great name to have. He understood that, but nobody thinks like that in Israel. It's a very sweet, common nickname. So, the son of Dodo, the Aholite, one of three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. And he arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to his sword. Now, I have heard of this happening before. In ancient times in battle, when a soldier fights um, uh, hour after hour, grasping the, the, the sword, that the hand just becomes um, fixed to the weapon. And they used to have to put it like in hot water just to, to re release the muscles and release the grip. So uh, he's out there fighting until his hand was weary, his hand stuck to his sword. It was like, you know, a extension of his body. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. After him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. A little bit of insight into Philistine war strategy. The Philistines were crafty, and they would often, we discover, let the children of Israel, or let any enemy they want to attack, grow things, and right around harvest, before it's ready to be picked and everything's grown on the vines, and even during or after the harvest when they've got everything stored up, then they get attacked by the Philistines. The Philistines rob their produce and uh, kill the people. And they would often do it while they're in the fields uh, so they could be taken by surprise and discomfited. And it would be, that, that was just sort of their strategy. So. Here you got a guy uh, in a field of lentils who's out there by himself, taking a sword out, you know, defending a field. Now think for just a moment. He could easily have thought, what kind of a life is this? Standing in a bean field with a sword, I should be doing something more important than this. This isn't an important thing for me to do. This isn't a glamorous role. How could this be the will of God for my life? Well, somebody needed to defend that field. And by him just being faithful to that little calling of taking your sword out in the bean field, it was like a Malagro bean field war. It, it, the Lord, it says right here, the Lord brought about a great victory. Just defending a bean patch, not despising the days of small beginnings. He will ascend into the role of being one of the mighty, notable men of David and forever be preserved on the pages of Holy Writ. He's in the Bible because he worked in a bean field and defended it. I love that. Just be faithful right where you are. Stay in the bean field. The Lord brought about a great victory. Then three of the 30 chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was in the stronghold and the garrison of the Philistines. Oh, and the Philistine was then in Bethlehem. So you get the picture. Bethlehem is where David is from. That's his hometown. Right now, the Philistines, who had been attacking the land, and now had, there's a full-fledged incursion into Bethlehem. They're occupying it. Uh, David is poised in battle against them. Um, it says, David said with longing, verse 15, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water, 
from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. I'm sure David was going, man, I remember when I was a kid, and I used to go out to that well out there by the gate of Bethlehem. That water was like the best ever. So sweet, so pure. Man, I'd like to have a drink of that now. So, verse 16, the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, took it, and brought it to David. Now, they're risking their lives to get him a little drink of water from his favorite watering hole. But what it shows me is here you have men sensitive to their king's desire. They're listening to the king. They're hearing what he says. They're understanding what he really wants. And they immediately go, let's do it. We'll do it for the king. So even as they were sensitive to their king's desire, are you sensitive to your king's desire? Psalm 123, the psalmist writes, as the hand of servants, or as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid looks to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes are upon the Lord. What does that mean? A servant would always look for hand signals of the king. The king just had to go, one little gesture, one signal, and that meant a command. And so the servant was always watching the hand of the king, the hand of the master, sensitive to the desires of the king. And I love this as a picture for us, that we, the, the, the more you grow in Christ, the more sensitive you should become to the will of God. You won't always know the will of God in every situation. That's why you depend. That's why you pray. That's why you counsel. But more and more, you'll become sensitive. Is this what he wants? What is his movement? What is his gesture? Oh, he wants water from the well of Bethlehem. Let's go do it. So they bring David. Water from the gate of Bethlehem. Nevertheless, this sounds anticlimactic, but I'll explain it. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out on the ground. Now, if you're the guy who got the water, go, really? Uh, I, I just risked my life, and you're just pouring it out on the ground. Thank you very little. But notice his rationale. He said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. Because they risked their lives, this water was like their own precious blood. And... In ancient times, oftentimes there was a, a sacrifice called a libation. It was part of a drink offering. Um, certain sacrifices in the Levitical law, they would pour wine. In certain cases, they would pour water. But it was, um, it was um, a descriptive of being, you know, being poured out and giving all of myself in those circumstances. David is sort of making this a libation, saying, I'm not worthy to drink this. You've risked your life. Pouring out this water is like you were willing to pour out your blood on my behalf. So these things were done by the three mighty men. Now, Abishai, you remember Abishai, the brother of Joab, you remember Joab, the son of Zeruiah. Remember, there were three sons of Zeruiah. Zeruiah was uh, the sister of King David, so uh, these guys were David's nephews. He was the chief of another three, Zeruiah. Uh, or the chief of another three, he lifted his spear against 300 men and killed them and won a name among these three. Was he not the most honored of three? Therefore, he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada, son of a valiant man from Kabzeel, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab, he also went down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. Now, this guy, Benaiah, becomes the chief of David's bodyguards, and also, when David dies, works for David's son, King Solomon, and becomes the general over all of his armies for Solomon. So, Benaiah takes the place of Joab. Joab was the commander of the armies of David. But after David dies, Solomon is the king, and Solomon chooses Benaiah 
as his commander or his general. But I just like the little things that are in the scripture. You just tend to pass them by. But I really love this guy because not only did he kill two lion-like heroes of Moab, but he went down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. Obviously, inclement weather didn't bother him. And he was so committed to rooting out problems or the enemy or lions that he'll do it on a snowy day. Now, I know, this is what J. Vernon McGee said. He said, I know some people who, if they see rain on their doorstep, won't come to church. <laughs> and yet here's a guy who will go fight a lion in a pit on a snowy day. I like guys like that. I want to hire guys like that. You know, they go, well, let me see your HR department and see what your benefits are. Yeah, don't need you. You want to kill a lion on a, in a pit on a snowy day? Awesome. Let's go. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff and wrested the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. So... The Egyptian, who was magnificent, had a spear. This guy just had a stick. He beat the Egyptian with a stick, took his spear, and killed him with his spear. I mean, this is just, this is like, you know, this is war uh, story stuff. These things, Benaiah, the son of Joiada, did, and won a name among the three mighty men. He was more honored than the 30, but he did not attain to the first three. And David appointed him over his guard. Asahel... The brother of Joab was one of the 30, that is the elite core, and the elite core is mentioned. I believe not only is the elite core mentioned here, but replacements uh, are mentioned for the elite core because they would have to be replaced. Some of them died over the years in battle. They would have to uh, have a succession plan. El Hanan, the son of Dodo, there's your favorite name, uh, of Bethlehem, Shammah, the Herodite, uh, Elika, the Herodite, Helez, the Paltite, Ira, the son of Ikesh, the Tekoite, uh, Abiezar, the Anath, Anathothite, Mebunai, the Hushite, Zalmon, the uh, Ahohite, Mahari, the Natafathite, I know you're wondering, why are you even reading these? We get, we get the idea, but let's just finish it off. Heleb, the son of Bana, the Natafathite, Ittai, the son of Ribai, he's the guy who made a lot of good steaks, <laughs> from Gibeah of the children of Benjamin, Benaiah, the Pyrothenite, uh, that's where the pirates came from, Hidai, the brooks of Gaash, Abi Albon, the Arbathite, Osmaveth, the Barhumite, Eliaba, the Shaalbanite of the sons of Jashan, Jonathan, Shama, the Hararite, Ahiam, the son of Sharar, the Hararite, Eliphelet, the son of Ahashbai, the son of uh, the Maakathite, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite, or Gilanite, Hezri, the Carmelite, Parai, the Arbite, Egal, the son of Nathan, of Zobah, Bani, the Gadite, Zelak, the termite, oh, that's not there, the Ammonite, <laughs> Nahari, the Beerothite, armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, Ira, the Ithrite, Gerab, the Ithrite, and all of those names, most of them don't matter to us, but look at the last one, and Uriah, the Hittite. 37 in all. Interesting that the list closes with the one man that would remind David perpetually of what brought him all the troubles in his life. The one glaring failure where he sinned with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, and then killed Uriah the Hittite, and that cover-up that brought so much destruction to his house and to the people of Israel. But... Again, I love the Bible. It's honest. It tells you the whole story. It tells you the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Not varnished. 
not trying to sell you on a candidate, just the truth. So some of these guys wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley, but glad that they worked for David. In debt, discontent, but mighty men and notable men, men that God used and through whom God brought victory. So I hope that encourages you because probably your life isn't even as close to being that bad as some of these guys. So if God can use them, and by the way, if God can use them and if God can use David, he can use you. I know I love 1 Corinthians 1, God has chosen the, chosen the foolish things of the world. I quote that a lot because that is my life verse. He chose a surfer who wanted nothing more than to just stay at the beach surfing, to be a leader in a place with an incredible amount of beach. Just no ocean. <laughs> but that's okay. New heavens and the new earth, there won't be one either. There's no more sea, so might as well get used to it. <laughs> but in the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth before the new heaven and the new earth, <laughs> get your surfboard waxed up, man thousand years of that. <laughs> Father, thank you. There's so many great promises that are uh, in this book, in your word, that we have to look forward to. So many different phases of our life, so many phases in eternity. Um, we are so thankful that you have made with us an everlasting covenant called the New Covenant. And uh, it would be something that you would write, you said, in the hearts of men and women not on tablets of stone, and you have done a work and written your law in our hearts. You have done a work in our lives. And we are so grateful that though we have not performed nor lived up nor been worthy of that calling at all times, we are recipients of great grace. And we see it reflected in David's life and in the life of his um, of his men and the people in his life. In Jesus' name. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.